we're obviously at the center of everything that's going on. Flying does not happen to us. It happens because of us. In other words, all of our actions, uh, actions that we take or even actions that we don't take are going to have some kind of performance consequence. And uh, so we can include in our actions, not only, not only physical actions on the controls, which is kind of our stick and rudder uh, focus uh, here today, but also the uh, aeronautical uh, decision-making, the thought process uh, that those are included when I say actions, actions have consequences. And I'm going to go back and kind of start more than 75 years ago with the classic tome, Stick and Rudder by Wolfgang Langevich. And in there, chapter 12, The Turn, he says that pilots as a group simply don't know how to turn. And unfortunately, I think in many ways, that's still true even today, this many decades later. And we can kind of go through this in, in terms of levels of learning. And of course, uh, everybody can do a turn, but maybe they don't know how the process really happens outside of the most fundamental type of turn that we learn. And of course, uh, talking or referring to the rote level of learning, which is a monkey see, monkey do. And, and basically we can, we can teach a monkey, we can teach a lot of uh, people to do very basic fundamental things. Think of the ABC song, maybe we all learned when we were kids uh, that helped us learn the alphabet. Well, that's a, an example of rote level of learning. But we really want to, as pilots, keep pushing ourselves up to the correlation level. So if monkey see, monkey do is the rote level, I like to think of the correlation level as if we were Neo in uh, the Matrix movies, where uh, Neo was able to see beyond kind of what everybody else was seeing, the, the simulated world and eventually was able to see the underlying code uh, that made up the world that he was experiencing and eventually was able to manipulate that code to manipulate the world around him. So I want us to maybe think uh, of flying like that in this particular picture, if you're seeing it on screen, uh, this is Neo dodging uh, bullets. And hopefully if we attain the correlation level in a lot of our flying, we might be able to, uh, uh, to avoid the occasional bullet as well. Hopefully we never have to do that though. And just as a quick review from last time, our primary controls elevator uh, is pitch, and that's going to be our head to feet or nose to toes, regardless of our attitude in space. The ailerons uh, control roll or bank, head to hip movement of the airplane, regardless of where we are in space. And also the rudder, which we, uh, which we kind of visualize as an ear to ear movement about the yaw axis. And I'm gonna add in the throttle here just to, just to round out the four primary controls. Let's think of the throttle as our here to there, our A to B, whatever A to B might be. Uh, throttle is our here to there control. And so I'm gonna kind of pose a, a quick question, have you just think for a couple of seconds and then we'll fill in the blanks here. In terms of fundamental maneuvers, and I'm not talking about the FAA's Fab Four, in terms of the building block maneuvers, how many are there and what are they? And so again, we're not thinking in terms of climb, climb, descend, turn, straight and level. Those are the FAA's Fab Four. What are the building blocks, the basic pieces from which we can build all maneuvers? And ultimately the answer is three, one per each of the primary control surfaces. Uh, we have a, a, an aileron inspired maneuver, we have a rudder inspired maneuver, and we have an elevator inspired maneuver. And all the maneuvers that we fly can be built up from pieces, components of these three building blocks. And so that kind of makes sense, I hope, uh, since we only have uh, three axes, three degrees of freedom with the airplane, uh, that there's really only three different maneuvers, one per, per axis. So let me change the question to this. How many distinctly unique flight paths are we able to fly on and what are they? Um, and again, thinking as broadly as we can, what flight paths are we able to uh, participate in or maneuver an airplane on? And if we really think about it and, and again, go as broadly as we can, we can go back and have a look at what NASA has to say about it, basic object motion. And they define it as two pieces translation and rotation. Translation meaning 
A to B, wherever that is in space and rotation, meaning around something. Could be around an axis of the airplane or it could be around something external to the airplane. And ultimately what we find is in the horizontal plane, translation and rotation look like straight lines and circles. Same thing has to be true in the vertical plane, straight lines and circles. And anything in between, any of the planes in between, the oblique planes, all we can ever do in the airplane is maneuver it along straight lines and circles or parts of circles and parts of straight lines. And so that kind of helps open up a, a different way of looking at how we not only do maneuvers, but how we build them, how we build them up, how we can deconstruct them into their, their component parts. So let's talk about uh, turn fundamentals now. And what we'll do is kind of talk about the attributes. What are the things that distinguish turning flight? And one of the obvious ones is that we are at some radius. We are some distance from a point out there in space. The other attribute is that we are moving around that point in space at some rate. Another attribute is that we are following the arc of some circle. And again, that could be anywhere in space. And we have some g. And when I say some g, it's some g other than one because we're flying along the arc of some circle. So all of our turning flight shares these attributes. And let's look at some examples. So we'll map out a maneuver, uh, the geometric plane that it occurs in, and then see if we can check off the boxes for radius rate, circle, and g load. Well, let's take a look at the level turn, the most familiar one to all of us, the, the maneuver we probably first learned to do happens in the horizontal. Yes, radius rate, circle, g-load, all there, all present. What about the chandelle? The chandelle happens in the oblique plane, off to the side somewhere, uh, and in the vertical uh, oblique. And yes, sure enough, it has a radius rate. We are following circles. Uh, you can think of it as a helix, a spring of some kind, if you want to look at it that way in three dimensions, and some g-load, something other than one. And then of course we have the loop, which is nothing more than a vertical turn, radius rate, circle, G load. In other words, the level turn, the chandelle, the loop, they satisfy all of the criteria. They share all of the attributes of turning flight. And they are indeed manifestations of exactly the same thing. And just because maybe we have a lot of experience with the level turn and, and not with the loop, doesn't mean that the loop isn't also turning flight. Maybe we have a little bit less experience with the chandelle, but it too, qualifies as turning flight. Well, let's take a look at one hop around the traffic pattern and see where all of these pieces are. If we rotate for takeoff, we're gonna do a little piece of a vertical turn. Maybe think of it as the very, very beginning of a loop, if you want. And then maybe on the uh, departure leg here, we're still climbing as we turn onto the crosswind leg. That's an oblique turn. And typically we'll reference, we'll call that a ground reference. Remember all those rectangular courses you practice as uh, private pilot applicants, or even the uh, uh, turns around a point to learn for uh, how to correct the turn, the radius for the turn to keep it constant by shallow, changing your bank angle for the wind. Well, that's an oblique climbing turn or at least a portion of it here in the pattern. So let's say by the time we're uh, crosswind to the downwind turn, we've reached pattern altitude, so we're just making a horizontal turn. Again, we'll call it a ground reference around some point on the ground. Uh, at the other end of the pattern, we're not quite ready to descend yet, so another horizontal turn from the downwind to the base leg. But now we want to start descending base to final, so that turn's going to be an oblique descending turn. Again, around some point on the ground that's hopefully wind corrected, that's why we learn all of those other maneuvers in primary days. And on those rare occasions, when a pilot will actually flare to land, you will actually culminate your flight with a little piece of a vertical turn, a little piece of a loop. So it's all there. It's all around uh, uh, present in one hop around the pattern. And it's a combination of, of pieces of turns in different geometric planes and straight lines, lines and, and curves. It's all there. So, the other as, uh, aspect I want to talk about is kind of transferring things. Again, if we're talking pilot centric, we're a little less interested, even though we can drill down and talk about the forces of flight, lift and weight in particular. Uh, but G load is a more important uh, 
uh, component for us. And then we'll talk about why that is. And we can convert forces like lift and weight into G load very simply. We just divide everything by weight. And so L over W, that gives us our G load, W over W, that's one G. And G load is important to us, first of all, because it's intuitive. When you're sitting in an airplane and you pull back on the sticker yoke, you feel that consequence. You start to feel heavier. When you push forward on the sticker yoke or the yoke, you start to feel lighter in your seat. And if you're aerobatically inclined, capable, and you're in a, in, in a capable aircraft, you can even switch the G from a positive G, meaning heavier in your seat, to a negative G, which means coming out of your seat and starting to feel heavier and heavier in your seat belts. So it's intuitive to think uh, and talk in terms of G. The other thing is our bo own body's design called something called proprioception. And that's our, our own awareness of our body's position where all of our pieces and parts are in space. And those pieces and parts are sensitive to changes in G load. So that makes sense to kind of talk in these terms because this is what we're going to feel. We're gonna sense this in the airplane. Also, if we were gonna put an instrument in, an, in the airplane to kind of measure what's going on, we don't put a scale in the airplane. When was the last time you heard anybody go say that they're gonna go out and fly and pull some pounds. Uh, we don't talk like that. We say we're gonna pull some Gs. And in fact, if we're going to put an instrument in the airplane to measure what's going on in that regard, it's going to be a G meter. Uh, and the default uh, setting is one. That's what we all feel sitting on our chairs right now. And then of course, if we're going to delve down into some performance diagrams, those diagrams themselves for consistency uh, one of the axes on them is G load. So there's a lot of reasons to think and talk when we talk about turning flight to kind of calibrate ourselves to G load for all of these different reasons that I'm mentioning here. So let's talk about one of those diagrams that has G load in it. And that's the load factor G, uh, G units versus bank angle. This is the standard FAA diagram. And hopefully many of you uh, remember seeing this or I don't know if you've seen it once and just kind of brushed past it or, or spent a little bit of time with it. This is a standard FAA treatment of uh, G load versus bank angle. I'm gonna spend the next several minutes sort of delving deeper. What, what other information is here that we can learn about and, and use to kind of understand this whole idea of turning flight? So I'm just gonna expand the diagram here. I'm calling, of course, the, the, uh, the lower axis is bank angle. You can give it the, the Greek symbol phi if you'd like. Uh, G load, but I'm being a little more uh, particular about it. It's G sub C, which means it's the cockpit G. It's the G we would see on a G meter. It's a G we would feel vertically uh, on our bodies, in our seats or in our seat belts uh, in the cockpit. And then for our purposes of this part of the discussion, how we have the airplane configured and what we're doing, we're gonna call the, the curve here our horizontal turns, right? So there are other things that we can do certainly, but, but just for our discussion moving forward here. So the blue curve represents horizontal turning. All right, so I can also add here another axis uh, on the right side called the stall speed multiplier, M. And so we know that all of these things are related somehow and it's quite simple if you, are, if you like to drill down into the math. Uh, the cockpit G required for us to be on that blue line for our horizontal turn is one over the cosine of the bank angle. And the stall speed multiplier is simply the square root of the G. So if the G is four, well, your stall speed multiplier square root of that is two. In other words, when you're pulling four Gs, your stall speed has, has doubled from the one G stall speed. The other aspect too, if uh, if you have a calculator on your phone, uh, typically this is an iPhone. Uh, this is all you'll get. It's just the basic add, subtract, multiply, divide. I don't know how many people know the trick. If you turn the phone sideways, at least on the iPhone, you get a lot more functionality out of it and you will, get, uh, you will have a cosine opportunity here and a one over X opportunity. You just have to make sure that, uh, that it's set uh, in degrees, not radians. You can see here in the lower right uh, portion says, rad for radians, which means if you click on that, it'll be radians. Otherwise, the default is uh, uh, degrees. So you can actually do some of that math if you were so inclined, but we don't ever really have to do that math. So let's come back here 
And again, look at the pilot centric part of this and, and really leave nothing to the imagination. Let's talk about bank angle. What controls bank angle? Well, we all know that it's the ailerons. Who controls the ailerons? The pilot. We do this, right? It doesn't happen to us, again, as we said. Let's look at the G-load. What is our primary uh, G sub C, the G meter in the cockpit? What do we use to control that? The elevator. Who controls that? We do. Again, flying doesn't happen to us. It happens because of us, because of actions we take or don't take. So this is a combination. This graph is a combination of what we choose to do or not do with the ailerons in the elevator. Very good. So I want to spend a couple of minutes now looking at this lower part that's circled in red. If you notice, it, the blue line is it's, a, it's an exponential curve, but we don't really see the exponentiality, the exponential nature of it until pretty far to the right on the diagram. Down here, where what we call kind of a, where most pilots spend most of their normal flying time, you notice that blue line doesn't move very much. We can have a pretty wide range in, in angle of bank with very, very little change in the required G-load to be there, uh, to be on the blue line. And this is one of the reasons it's called, it's a, it's a uh, um, psychology thing called the differential, uh, difference threshold, sorry, uh, called Weber's law. Uh, all of our senses have certain thresholds, not only where we can start to perceive something, but also where we start to perceive a difference in that something. And between, say, five degrees of bank or, or even 15 to 30 degrees of bank, even though we double the angle of bank, which is very noticeable to us visually looking outside the airplane, the change in the G is so small that we barely even notice it. It's within that difference threshold where we don't really perceive it. And I think this is one of the key reasons why uh, when I surveyed nearly 900 pilots across the country, two thirds of them believed that the ailerons were the primary control you use for turning flight. Because we don't see or we don't perceive in normal flight where we spend most of our time, the role of the elevator, it's almost imperceptible. We almost don't even have to do anything with it. Uh, for that matter, right? Uh, particularly if the trim is fairly well set. It's not until we start getting further to the right, higher bank angles, where, where we really start to see the true nature, not only of the exponential growth in the G required, but what we have to do with the elevator in terms of bending that flight path. So now let's come back to our uh, picture here. And I've, I've sort of highlighted the upper part, the upper quadrant in a little darker uh, blue color from horizontal turns. So if we're not on the blue line, let's say our bank angle and G load combination, which we've chosen, we've set, puts us somewhere in this blue zone above the blue line. What's the airplane doing? What's happening? And again, all other things being equal, we've got uh, a configuration that allows us to be there. This is the oblique climbing turn zone. Shondells happen here. This is where we are. And if we move even farther uh, to the left on here, what if we start without any bank angle at all? And now I have a magenta line, just pure G. We haven't done anything with the ailerons at all. What's happening now? Well, these are our vertical turns. This is where your loop begins. The other interesting thing with the loop, as we saw last time, is halfway through the loop, your bank angles actually changed, gone from zero to 180 degrees of bank. And then it comes back around from 180 to zero degrees of bank again, back in upright flight. But we can show this, or at least we can model it on this diagram. Well, how about if we're to the right and below our blue horizontal turn lines? What's happening now? If the speed and G combination are such that it puts us in that zone, well, these are the oblique descending turns. Your base to final in the pattern where you're descending, yeah, you're somewhere in here. Probably nowhere near that far right side, probably much, uh, much closer to the left side in that maybe a very, very slim slice uh, there uh, below that blue line. But that's where we are operating typically when we're descending uh, based a final turn or any other time we're doing a descending spiral as another example. Uh, the other thing we can do on this diagram is we can also talk about design limits, airplane design limits. Why not? Uh, perfect uh, segue to introduce that onto the picture. And these, uh, I've, I've put the design limits for the case of an airplane with the flaps up 
and no rolling. In other words, just a pure elevator uh, input. And we have, we can, we can superimpose normal, which is 3.8 on the positive side, just talking positive G flight, because that's where we mostly spend our time. We can have another parallel discussion for the negative G side, but let's stay on the positive. Um, uh, the uh, utility category, 4.4 G, and then the acrobatic category, 6 G. So look at what we've done with this basic diagram. The diagram uh, that the FAA gives us, that most of us pass by, to this more information rich diagram that really shows us what's going on when we decide to do X with the elevator and Y with uh, the ailerons or vice versa, if you wanna put the X axis and the Y axis in the proper places. Uh, but it really shows that we can have that discussion uh, with pilots on the ground and then we can transfer that into the actions, the practice in the airplane and kind of visualize where are we? Where are we in this whole picture? Let's take a classic example that we talk about, even though maybe we don't usually get there until we start commercial pilot training. But let's uh, say we wanna do a 60 degree bank turn, uh, level turn. So we wanna be at 60 degrees of bank on the blue line. Well, in order to be there, we have to pull two Gs. And so the question is, once I've rolled to 60 degrees of bank, What's my lag time as the pilot to get up to two Gs, to build up to that two Gs? Well, there is no lag. It's gotta be instantaneous. But a lot of times what happens is pilots will get behind it. They'll roll into 60 and then they never quite get or it takes them a long time to get to two Gs. Maybe they're at 1.5. Well, if we're at 1.5, we're in the descending part. So now the turn starts going downhill. And as it heads downhill, the other interesting thing is there might be a tendency for the bank to increase. Well, as the bank increases, now the G has to go up as well to get us back on the blue line. And here's the weird thing. If the bank angle goes from 60 degrees to 66, that's just a 10% change in the bank angle. You now have to pull 2.5 Gs, which is a much greater percentage increase on the pull. And trust me, most pilots, if they haven't pulled two at 60, they're not gonna get they're not gonna pull 2.5 at 66. And you can see all of a sudden, quickly the turn falls apart. They're in a descending spiral. The easiest thing you can do is unload some G, shallow the bank and put yourself back to a, a position where you can intercept the blue line at a lower, much lower G load at a different angle of bank. And also keep in mind that while we're doing this, the stall speed multiplier, our stall speed has gone up 40% over the one G stall speed. And when I'm talking in terms of the stall speeds uh, in this multiplier, I'm talking about calibrated airspeed. So you have to just keep that in mind. We do this math on calibrated speeds and then we have to look at our airspeed correction charts to uh, tell us what we're actually gonna see on the uh, airspeed indicator. And then if we wanna drill down and, and show a G diagram, replacing the lift diagram at 60 degrees of bank, well, we're balanced. We have one G up, one G down. Uh, the diagonal uh, cockpit G is at two. That's what we're feeling on our body uh, vertically and also seeing on the G meter. And there's a radial G of 1.7 that's bending the flight path around the center of this horizontal turn. All of this is happening to us when we're uh, performing this type of level turn. So now I'm going to ask the question, uh, and this is a, a picture taken out of a, a typical they're playing flying handbook, pilot operating handbook that shows angle of bank uh, for different flap settings uh, and gives us indicated and calibrated uh, stall speed. So the question is, why does stall speed change with bank angle? Well, we know a little bit more information now. Let's, let's add the other elements because after all, this, these numbers, these are points off of that picture we just saw a moment ago. So I can put on uh, a, a row here for G and a row here for the stall speed multiplier. Zero degree of bank, well, that's upright flight, one G. 30 degrees, 1.15. Even at 45 degrees at 1.4, we're probably still in, that, uh, still in that zone where we can't really perceive the G, especially at 30 degrees. So, you know, we might not even feel that we're doing much with the elevator in that per uh, particular case. So in the end, bank angle does not affect the stall speed. The G required does. 
as the, the bank angle goes up, we have to pull more G in order to perform that level turn. So the stall speed goes up because the G required for that turn changes. And the stall speed multiplier shows us, okay, at 30 degrees of bank, stall speed's up about 7%. So let's zero in here. If we do the math, looking at the calibrated column here, 53 knots calibrated times 1.07, Guess what? The manufacturers don't make these numbers up. They have to use the same math that we have to use, 57. And they'll usually be within a knot or so. It all depends on how they round off their numbers. But here it is. And again, uh, we, might not, we might still be below that difference threshold and not even realize that. But here's the other thing when we're thinking in terms of looking at this, uh, this type of information in the POH. 30 degrees of bank and... 1.07 Gs at 57 knots calibrated, which will be 52 indicated, the airplane's going to stall. But it'll actually stall any time it's at 57 knots calibrated, 52 indicated at 1.07 G. Where might that happen? So you have a pilot who's coming in for landing. Wings are perfectly level. They're decelerating, but they're a couple feet above the ground and they pull just a little too much at 57 calibrated, 52 indicated, they stall and drop it in. There's an example of an accelerated stall, very quick and short, uh, an accelerated stall. So anytime you're at 57 knots calibrated in this particular airplane, 30 degrees of bank or not, you'll stall the airplane. So back to our rote, the horizontal component of lift. One of the things we all learn, I know we can all recite it, probably forwards and backwards, Monkey see, monkey do, the horizontal component of lift turns the airplane. Okay, let's look at a horizontal component of lift turning an airplane. Any doubt? Any doubt that it's true that the horizontal component of lift turns the airplane, especially in the horizontal plane here. But it probably wasn't what you were expecting. So if we, if we go one level up in our understanding from rote to the understanding level, it's about manipulating the magnitude and the direction of lift. Lift can come out of either side of the uh, wing, uh, maybe not so much in most of the flying we do, or, or not very much of it is available on the negative G side, but in an aerobatic airplane or in the broader context, it doesn't matter which side it comes out, and we control that. Uh, in a very specific way. So the magnitude and the direction of lift is what we manipulate. Well, if we move up to the application level, now we start to see that we must apply the elevator correctly for the desired performance. And now for NEO and the matrix at the correlation level, we bend or straighten the flight path with elevator inputs. Even though in the very shallow, the very small slice of the envelope between zero and 30 degrees of bank, we don't even realize it or we really don't have to do much in that regard, that's what we're doing. We control our flight paths, bending it or straightening it out with what we do with the elevator. And this starts to open up, if we think like this, it starts to open up a better understanding or a way to, for us to dissect some of the things we might see, say at an air show for an, exa for an example, or imagining, well, how do I break down the chandelle so that I really understand what are the pieces of it and where do I need to put my focus in order to do the maneuver well? <coughs> Excuse me. So bottom line, when we get to, get to this point is, well, who cares, right? Who cares that we really know what each of the controls really does? Why does it matter? Again, as we talked, uh, opened up the last uh, talk, 85% of aviation accidents are attributed to pilot error. In other words, things the pilot did or did not do. Miscommunications that the pilot had with the airplane. Thinking that the pilot needed to do something with one control surface where the problem was with the other control surface. And let me, I, I sort of, it gave you a little bit of an exploded view of this uh, last time with the classic skidding base to final turn, but let me go through it again. So here's a pilot performing a, a base to final turn, just a normal turn, nice and coordinated, but either through uh, mistiming the turn or some wonky winds on that particular day has overshot the runway center line. Now there are 
several options available at this point. One of them is simply level the wings and go around and try to set it up better the next time. That's, that's a pretty safe uh, option in, in a lot of cases. Maybe not so much where I live, where we have backcountry flying, where uh, you might have one way in, one way outs, and go-arounds are not available, but that's kind of a, a unique situation. But in this particular case, the pilot is compelled, for whatever reason, to kind of get back to the runway center line. So the most common thing pilots will do is start to apply the inside rudder. So let's imagine it's a, we're banked to the left, it's a left turn, the pilot starts to apply left rudder. As the pilot looks out over the nose of the airplane, the airplane responds by yawing toward the pilot's left ear. The pilot sees the nose start slicing downward and leftward through the horizon. Well, of course, we all know that the elevator keeps the airplane up, right? So the pilot sees the nose slicing downward and leftward and reacts to the inappropriate rudder input by pulling back on the elevator. Well, what does the elevator do? It bleeds off speed, it increases G and it tightens this descending spiral. And what happens when that happens? Well, the stall speed is starting to increase now as well, isn't it? And maybe bank angle starts to increase. And so this whole process keeps feeding on itself until right at the moment of departure, the airplane rolls sharply into the, into the spin to the left, pilot applies right aileron and the airplane hits the ground. Maybe not even that far before it hits the ground all because of a total miscommunication, not understanding what each of the controls does, not seeing the result of the control inputs out there and, and trying to fix one problem with, with something else that creates its own problem. And so if we understand that, that changes in angle of attack on the main wing, which occur because of things we're doing with the elevator primarily, manifest as changes in speed, changes in G load, tightness or looseness of turns, then maybe we can react more appropriately, uh, avoid the situations in the first place. But if we find ourselves creeping down that, that chain of events, the, the links in the chain, we can break that chain and maybe reduce the, the uh, contribution to general aviation accidents that are caused by pilot error. And so now I wanna to move to this uh, deconstructing the Shondell. And this was a uh, graphic from the uh, FAA's Airplane Flying Handbook of 2004. It's a different graphic now. I think the, the latest one is 2016 or so. The, so they've used a different graphic. So kind of the assumptions where the air has been cleared, your airplane's configured, the throttle position is fixed. You don't have to mess with that again. And your max bank angle is 30 degrees. So it's a commercial type Shondell. First question I ask is, what is it? Big picture, 10 words or less. A lot of different ways to describe it. I'll describe it like this. The Shondell is a 180 degree climbing turn. Boom, done, Bro as broad as it can be. Now we gotta fill in the details, right? Describe the initial and final energy states. Well, the initial energy state, relatively speaking, is higher speed, lower altitude. The final energy state is higher altitude, lower speed. So energy states, that's potential and kinetic energy. Potential is height above the ground and um, kinetic energy is speed. So done. So that's done. Describe the three main parts. Well, there are three main parts, given that we're ready to go. Uh, it's the coordinated establishing of the bank angle, 30 degrees. That's part one. The second part is the first 90 degrees of heading change. And this is a ground reference maneuver. So before we start, we should pick a point out there on the horizon, left or right, by sighting down the wing in that direction, picking a point out there on the horizon as the next point we need to go to, the next heading. So uh, we have our first part, coordinated establishment of the bank, 30 degrees. Second part uh, is, a, is the first, gets us to the first 90 degrees, which I'll describe like this. In that first 90 degrees of heading change, we have variable pitch, constant bank. The bank remains at 30. The pitch goes from whatever it was in level flight to maximum nose up attitude, whatever that is at the 90 degree point. And then the third piece of this is um, going from the 90 to the 180 degree point, which was ends us up 180 degrees from where we started. And in that piece, this is what's happening. It's going to be constant pitch, variable bank. Whatever nose attitude we set, the high point at the 90 degree point, we need to maintain all the way through the next 90 to end up in a nose high, slow flight attitude, possibly even with the stall warning uh, 
horn chirping at us. And in that last 90, we are slowly, we're timing the rollout, taking the bank from the max of 30 degrees back to wings level by the time we're on heading. Now, of course, there's all kinds of rudder in the mix here that uh, is in the background canceling yaw. Um, and by canceling yaw, well, there's a mix, right? If we're, if we're rolling, well, okay, there's some adverse yaw, but we're also slowing down. So there could be torque P factor and slipstream. And so whatever the net leftover yaw is of all of that stuff, we have to cancel with the rudder to maintain coordinated flight. And in the end, for most of the airplanes we're flying, we would expect to end up nose high, slow flight, opposite uh, direction we started on with some right rudder into cancel torque P factor slipstream, regardless of whether it was a left or a right um, Shondell. So the pilot action is the doing. So we're mostly focusing on the elevator and the aileron, mostly working on the diagram we had a moment ago. Rudder is there kind of silently working in the background, just canceling the yaw. Pilot perceptions, the sensing, this is a ground reference. So let's go by sight, sound, and feel. Feel helps us with the coordination, but we're picking our point straight ahead of us. We're picking, we have a point off to our wing left or right as the 90, and then there's something behind us. And then the potential problems or errors. Well, initially, once the pilot sets in that first part of the uh, Shondell, once they set the 30 degrees of bank, remember we talked last time, as soon as you start moving in the vertical, bank angle is naturally going to increase in a loop starts at zero degrees of bank and it starts and it ends up at 180 degrees at the top. In a Shondell, if you just leave it at, leave the bank alone and do a straight pull in an aerobatic airplane, you will end up at 150 degrees of bank. So in order to keep this commercial grade and not upset passengers, you should expect to be continually rolling. If you're doing a left Shondell, continually rolling, very slight, subtle to the right throughout to maintain 30 degrees of bank. And then of course, when we get to this, the, the last part, we are now actually rolling enough to change the bank from 30 to zero. So once we start the maneuver, there is some roll going on in the opposite direction of the Shondell, right? And so we're pulling the nose up in that first 90 to our, whatever that point is on the horizon. Then we have to hold that nose up. And as the speed is bleeding off, we have to keep applying more and more back pressure which keeps the airplane turning on the curved flight path of the Shondell to the 180 point. And interestingly enough, um, if you really want to freak somebody out, you can get good enough with the Shondell that all you need is that 90 degree point. And once you start the Shondell, you should be looking toward that 90 degree point back and forth between the nose and kind of seeing the, the bank angle over the nose and, and that point and bringing the nose, pulling the nose above that point. And then, like I said, if you want to freak out an examiner or somebody sitting in the right seat, let's say you're doing a Shondell to the left, you can keep looking in that, at that 90 degree point and roll the wing over to that point and never change your view. So now you're looking through the person who's sitting to on the right side. It, it's kind of a weird way of doing it, but you can do it and you can feel the yaw and everything else. So um, again, kind of injecting a little bit of how aerobatic pilots uh, learn to think a little bit differently on things. So potential problems, of course, like we said, uh, letting the bank increase in that first uh, heading change to the 90 degree point, um, stalling the airplane in the second part of it, uh, getting all uh, cattywampus in terms of yaw control, trying to use the rudder to make up for heading changes and, and kind of fixing uh, heading errors at the end. Um, and so this is how I might deconstruct a Shondell and how I might teach it in a classroom. And then we would go out and, and focus on each of these individual parts. So the next question I asked was what was wrong with that FAA diagram? Well, now that we know, if you look at uh, the tail end of the airplane on the right side, those ailerons are in the wrong position. They're in the correct position, uh, the snapshot of the airplane before it where the airplane is rolling into the 30 degree bank but this is the 90 degree, uh, the first 90 degree part of the heading change. We would expect those ailerons, if anything, to be slightly outboard from where they are. So the artist's rendering here uh, is not accurate and the details do matter. So uh, anyway, that's uh, be interesting to, to interact with others in terms of how they described the maneuver um, 
that was posed here. And so, as I mentioned last time, I'm going to encourage you to go out and experiment, visualize, you know, sit at home, go through the motions, uh, gather again, whether it's virtually or in person at the airport and share, maybe uh, when it's appropriate, take somebody with you and, and enjoy the experiment together. A very simple experiment you can do is to simply roll to a, a coordinated bank, uh, let's say 30 degrees, establish the level turn. Again, you're not going to notice doing very much with the elevator. But now, pull more on the elevator than you need and start bending the flight path upward. Start a chandelle. And then release some of the elevator and let the nose come on back down to the horizon line and track track the horizon line in that normal coordinated 30 degree bank turn. Keep the, keep the bank constant. Then relax the elevator pressure and let the flight path start to bend downward a bit. And so you can, you can start manipulating the elevator. Nothing says that you, you can't move it around and, and see the effect on flight path. Do the same thing from wings level. Apply a little bit, release a little bit, right? And we all know when you're pulling out of a dive, yeah, you're pulling on the elevator. That's why it's called pulling out of a dive. So experiment, visualize, uh, share what you're learning, what you're figuring out, and uh, see if others can understand, if you can explain it in a way that's better than I can or that uh, other people can understand as well. So at this point, I'm going to um, put in the plug for uh, the two other talks that, we're gonna, that I'm going to do. Um, you can uh, register at communityaviation.com, maximum class sizes to keep it an in intimate setting, 10 people. Uh, one hour classes, cost is 1995. Um, the first one we're gonna do in uh, mid-November, it's gonna be learn to use the primary controls, which is part two, which is the legitimate part two from uh, the previous discussion on the primary controls, which now adds in power. The part one was just um, roll yaw and pitch. Now we're going to talk about and explore the meaning of pitch and power equaling performance. What does that really mean? And then de uh, the December one is going to be a, a pilot's guide to all attitude training. If you're, if you're interested in pursuing spin training, emergency maneuver training, upset prevention recovery training, or even aerobatics, uh, you want to become as the most savvy buyer of that service as possible because it is it is a unique environment with unique uh, requirements uh, and should have unique qualifications, even though there aren't any for instructors. Uh, believe it or not, a private pilot can teach aerobatics. They can't get paid for it. They can't make any endorsements, but they can teach aerobatics. A commercial pilot can at least get paid to teach aerobatics, but they can't make any required FA endorsements. They, if they sign your logbook, it's just an autograph. A CFI can teach aerobatics, even if they've never done it before, and they can give you logbook endorsement. So you really wanna be buyer beware um, so that your experience is as safe and as enjoyable and you get as much out of it as possible. So, uh, so these are a couple of things that we're going to be, uh, be looking forward to. So Gabe, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna stop, uh, stop sharing here and see if there are any questions on the board. Awesome, thank you so much, Rich. That was fantastic, um, as always. We do have a question here from John Green in the chat. John, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask that question? I don't know, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Add, so um, I think you've said before that centrifugal force is not really part of the equation in a turn. And I didn't quite grasp that. And maybe I misunderstood it, but can you explain that? Okay, so a lot of times when you see the diagrams, there's a centripetal and a centrifugal force. Uh, the FAA is notorious for showing, showing all of the forces as being balanced. Well, if the forces are balanced, there's no acceleration. Um, and so if you, if you kind of think back to that, the diagram that I showed of bank versus G, and I showed that tile that had all the G loads on it, there was one G up, one G down, they're balanced. So we're, we're in a steady level, we're in level flight anyway. Um, but then there was a horizontal component, it was called a G sub R, a radial G pointing to the inside of the turn. Uh, that is the centripetal force. That's the force that's curving the flight path. We don't talk about the centrifugal because it's, it's an artificial force uh, as far as we're concerned with the turn. 
Otherwise, it, it's used as a device to kind of show the forces balanced, but they're not really balanced in a turn. Otherwise, we wouldn't be turning. Does, it, does that help? Does that? Yeah, I think so. So the the force that we would probably feel as centrifugal force is really just the G load, the load factor, right? Yeah, so what we actually feel is the cockpit G. So if you imagine yourself, if you're in coordinated flight and pulling on the elevator, it doesn't matter whether I'm banked or I'm upright, I feel the G in a line from head through, through, through my spine into the seat, no lateral G at all. And so we feel that G in the airplane, which is also the G that you would see on a G meter installed in front of you. But there is a radial G, there is a radial component to that G. There's a vertical component, which is uh, offsetting uh, the one G weight of the aircraft. And then there's a horizontal component of that uh, centerline G, that cockpit G, that is the radial G that's, that's uh, turning the airplane. So they're just components of, of that central G that we're feeling in the cockpit. Any other questions? I can't believe that that I've answered every question in this uh, short amount of time that there could possibly be. Anybody want to, you know, give some experiences about uh, that they might have had with aerobatics or turning flight or turns that have gone wrong that we can talk about how to how to fix and things like that. There, usually some classic symptoms that we can discuss. Well. Yeah. Um... I had I did aerobatics a long time ago in a decathlon, 150 horse decathlon, and uh, and my instructor loved to go out to the practice area inverted until the header tank went dry. Uh, so the clearing turns were interesting because it wasn't left or right because that didn't make any sense anymore. You just go go this way or go that way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting now that we try to flip it upside down. Uh, but here's the interesting part: if 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 we're truly talking in terms of a pilot centric, like we don't care what's, what a ground observer says we're doing. We only care how the airplane moves relative to us. Uh, pitch head to feet is still the same, right side up and inverted. Left rudder and right rudder are still left rudder and right rudder inverted. The control that works in the opposite sense from say level inverted flight is the aileron because it's a differential control. So, you would, you would apply aileron to the right, but apply left rudder to cancel the adverse yaw because of the differential nature of the control. So it, the only, if we want to talk in terms of something that's reversed, it's only the aileron. Uh, pitch is still head to feet. Uh, left and right is still left and right. So interesting. But I think I've only ever run the header tank out in a decathlon once. I had two minutes inverted in a decathlon is, might as well be an hour. <laughs> so uh, it's a very long time. <laughs> Other yeah, questions, other comments? Yeah, I had a quick um, question or comment about um, just like I'm, I'm relatively new pilot, um, student pilot, but um, we were doing a power on stall recovery during my pre-solo like prog check the other day and I didn't apply enough right rudder. So it was sort of like a, it was, it was such a weird feeling because it was almost like we were, would that be slipping like into the, inside anyway it's just interesting like hearing more about all of these different control inputs and stuff because sure in sure. that sense we weren't close to a spin but it was like getting there you know what i mean like not enough right rudder i guess right and and so uh, thanks for bringing that up because it, it it's something that that a lot of pilots new and old uh can struggle with and and some of that just has to do with you know, the initial training of it and how, how it's done kind of carries through. So what we first learn, I mean, that, that sticks with us. Um, there are two ways to be in an airplane. And, and when we're new to, say, to flying or new to a, a different airplane or learning new maneuvers, we will tend to fall back into a reactive mode. Whereas a pilot centric, a pilot in command mode is a proactive mode. And the difference is reactive, we wait for the plane to do something and then we fix it. Whereas a proactive is I'm going here, follow me airplane, right? And it takes time and confidence and you know, kind of really seeing what's going on before you can kind of get to that point consistently. 
And so with power on stalls, a couple of things that, that I do with students, first of all, don't look inside the airplane, right? All of those instruments are lagging indicators, especially in the dynamic environment of a stall break, right? <laughs> Slip skid ball, totally useless. Don't look at any of that. Look outside, right? Pick a point out there in the distant horizon. And here's what I'll ask you to do. As weird as this sounds, run to that point. Run at it. And by run, I don't mean Frankenstein left, Frankenstein right. I mean, you're running over hot coals. You go left rudder, neutral rudder, right rudder, neutral rudder, left neutral, right neutral, right neutral. And in the end, what you'll find is that you will apply net right rudder to keep that nose on that point. Now, it seems weird, right? That we actually wanna do more, but when I say do more, I mean much higher frequency, but smaller amplitude. If you just punch in the right rudder and leave it there and wait to see what's gonna happen, it's gonna swing hard in that direction, right? So we need to add and subtract the input, right? So I want you to go next time and, 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 and go into it as if you're gonna follow me and this is where we're gonna go. And even if the airplane dips off on uh, say tips to the left because it wasn't enough right rudder, keep pumping the right rudder until you pump the wing back up. And of course, while you're doing that, you're pushing the nose, you're lowering the angle of attack, right? right? We're not staying there, although there is an exercise you can do uh, with a, an instructor who really knows how to do it called a falling leaf or a rudder stall, an oscillation. It goes by a lot of names. We actually hold the stall, but you learn to move your feet high enough frequency, small enough amplitude actually to stay on heading. And in the end, you move so the airplane doesn't move, which is a very strange way of, of thinking about it, right? So, so next time you have that opportunity, play more, not less, play more, because that's how we learn, right? Let's see the result. If we haven't been doing enough, well, how do we know where too much is? And once we've seen the two sides, we know where the middle is, right? called bracketing. So kind of talk it over with your instructor to say, hey, this is, I'd like to try this or that. What do you think, right? And, and if he's amenable or she's amenable to it, play more, experiment. That's what it's about. Cool, thank you. Sure. That, that's fantastic. Rich, I'm gonna ask you a question from, um, from the feed on Facebook Live. Where is the best place to start in terms of gaining the education to teach aerobatics? Probably the, I, I can tell you how I did it and it worked for me, but there, there are other avenues as well. Uh, I actually learned to fly because I wanted to do aerobatics. So as soon as I got my private license, I, I went to the first place that had a sign out that said aerobatics here, which in the end, I would probably be a little more discerning about it. <laughs> um, but just go out and, and do it. And one way to do that is if you go to the uh, website, it's the International Aerobatic Club. It's www.iac, India Alpha Charlie.org. Uh, you'll see a how to get started tab. If you pull that down, you'll see a directory of aerobatic schools. Now, they don't endorse or check any of the listings on there. Uh, but if you, if you look there, you'll see a listing of people who will do spin training, upset training, aerobatic training. And so that might be a, at least a good resource to start. If you go to my website, uh, there's a pull down tab. I can't remember what it's called because I hardly ever, it's like trying to recall your phone number because you never have to look it up anymore. Um, <laughs> you'll find that, that I do have, an, I do have a, a PDF there on guide to all attitude training that gives you some information. Some of the information that I'm gonna discuss in December in the class, um, but, but you know, see if what they're talking about makes sense. When you go to learn these sorts of things, you're not sitting there having it done to you. You're doing, I very rarely ever touch the controls. I talk people through stuff because usually when I say here, watch this, something bad happens. So I've, I've learned a long time ago to stay out of it. I'll teach you, right? So, and, and so you should be doing most of the flying. You should be having ground school so you understand beforehand what you're going to see and do. You have a plan, you fly the plan, just like across country, right? So, so uh, these are just some ways to get started in it, but uh, be discerning. Don't just, you know, go to anybody who says, yeah, I did that once or twice uh, a while ago, right? Be discerning. Sure. Okay. 
Thank you. And I, I did post that over on Facebook, um, the link to the IAC.org. Um, we have a uh, question in here in the chat uh, about a hammer uh, hammerhead stall turn. When Again, I was getting checked out. We had that last time. <laughs> yep. So uh, the question is, how is it possible to do a hammerhead with, without the opposite aileron and push? Oh, it is possible. It just won't be very pretty. Uh, the airplane will come around, but it'll come around instead of in the vertical plane, it'll come around, it'll twist and it'll tuck. So it'll be off the vertical. It'll have, it'll kind of be a crooked loop and it's gonna kind of pitch onto, onto its back. I, it's hard to show it in reverse here on the camera. So uh, it's hard, harder to preserve uh, the vertical plane of the pivot uh, to, to make it a pure yaw pivot. So it, it'll, it'll be sloppy. And, and I come from a background where uh, I learned aerobatics to, com to do some competition aerobatics. In fact, uh, I, and I'm not at all suggesting I'm anywhere in the league of Patty Wagstaff, although we are friends, and Sean Tucker, we are friends. Uh, I was a, a beginning sportsman pilot at the time they were flying unlimited uh, aerobatics before they went into uh, air show work. Um, but but I grew up kind of in the competition where it's a funny thing, competition versus air show. At an air show, a pilot shows up um, and they can they usually get paid and, and they get fuel and hundreds of thousand people uh, of people tell them how great they are. At, at an aerobatic competition, you go out in the middle of nowhere, there are no spectators, you pay a bunch of money, take a bunch of time off, get burned up in the sun, and you pay a bunch of other pilots to tell you how much you suck. And so that's how I grew up in competition aerobatics. So, you know, what, do you want to do a, a sucky hammerhead or do you want to try to strive for a, a, a higher grade hammerhead, I should say? That's awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. Well, thank you for that. Look, we'll do uh, maybe one more question. Uh, if anybody has anything, uh, anybody that is still online, if you want to ask a question, go for it right now. Um, I'm looking at Facebook. I think we're good. Anybody else have any questions for Rich? Yeah, I have a question, uh, Gabe. Okay. So, so Rich, yet, yet another fascinating session. So thank you so much. Sure, no, thank you for showing up. So I think, and I'm still trying to get this straight in my head, I think my greatest takeaway from this session was it's not the bank angle that causes the stall, it's the resulting G-force increase that causes the stall, right? That's correct. So stall speed is tied to G load, right? So at 1G, you have a 1G stall speed. So when people, we kind of talk pretty loosely in aviation, you know, somebody will say, oh, well, what's the stall speed of the airplane? Well, the correct answer is almost any speed. You know, what speed would you like me to stall it at? Um, usually when we say what's the stall speed, we're referring to a very specific one, the 1G stall speed. Right, but there are stall speeds for 1.5 G, 2 G, or you you name it. There's a stall speed that goes with it, and so when we're talking bank angle, the assumption the manufacturer is making is you're rolling into that bank angle to do a a coordinated level turn, right? Which is going to require some G, which means the stall speed goes up, right? So stall speed is a function of weight, isn't it? If your airplane is more heavily loaded, stall speeds go up. If your airplane is more lightly loaded, stall speeds go down. Well, G-load is a way for us to impose, you can almost think of it as a, maybe virtual is not quite the right word, but it's a virtual weight. We're adding and subtracting as opposed to physically putting stuff in or off the airplane. And so weight is weight and stall speed and weight are tied together, which leads to another point. What is maneuvering speed? The maximum speed at which you can apply apply, let's say, full elevator, right? And what? And what? The airplane will stall before it breaks. Maneuvering speed is in a normal category airplane with the flaps up, only pulling on the elevator. Maneuvering speed is the 3.8G stall speed. That's all it is. It's another stall speed. That's all it is. So when you have the question, why does maneuvering speed vary with weight? Well, because stall speed varies with weight and it's a stall speed. Why don't we tell pilots that? It's the upper end stall speed before you get into structural problems, right? So from that standpoint, all of that starts to make sense, right? And uh, so hopefully maybe that's a little more in there that you want, but now, we're, now we can talk about an entire stall curve in an airplane. 
right? It's not just a stall speed, but a stall curve. That's a combination of speed and G that puts you on that line where critical angle attack is going to be exceeded. Beautiful, thank you. I'm game for one more question if anybody wants, or if, if I'm getting uh, redundant, then it's time to leave. <laughs> uh, let's see, um, anybody else? Um, the floor you is yours if you have a question for Rich. To continue that line of thought, um, the relationship between weight and stall speed is that as your weight goes up, the required angle of attack to maintain level of flight goes up. And at some point you, you reach that critical angle of attack, right? Yeah, so it, it, the airplane has to do a lot more work, right, for that. And so we need to do something to get the coefficient of lift up so that we're trying to balance lift. We're always trying to balance lift and weight in, in most of the, the normal flying that we're doing. So how do we do that? Well, we need to get more lift. Well, how do we do that? Well, the wing area doesn't change, right? We're not, we're not flying variable wing plan form type things. So we're going to have to operate at a higher angle of attack at a higher a coefficient of lift to offset that. Also see something from uh, Mike on here, Mike Schwartz, uh, to the ag pilots out there when they're doing their kind of lazy eight uh, wing over turnarounds uh, after a swath pass, is the path is to unload the wing in the middle. Yes, you would want it. Absolutely, right? You want to do that uh, because if you're going up, speed's decaying. But if I keep adding G, if the speed is going down and the G is going, staying constant or going up, you're going to cross that accelerated stall line. If speed is going down, at some point you gotta unload the G, you gotta get rid of some weight. So speed down, G down is a good trend. Speed going up, you can start to G up as well, up to the design limit. Um, but, but if they're in opposite directions, like in that skidding base to final turn, where the pilot is pulling back, speed's going down, but G's going up, they hit an accelerated uh, uh, stall spin entry from a, from a nose low banked attitude. So that's a very good point, uh, Mike, and that's, that's exactly on uh, the right thing to do. One of the things Fantastic. that's fun to point out is the fact that you don't have a stall speed at uh, zero G. Correct, because there's no airflow over the wing, right? So you, there's no flow to separate, therefore you can't be stalled. So when people call it, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer to call it a stall turn or a hammerhead stall. There's no stall at all if you're doing it properly. It's just a, it's a yaw pivot is what it ends up being. Well, this is uh... then the, the corollary to that is when you walk out, when you're walking on the ramp to go pre flight your airplane on a calm wind day, is the airplane stalled? It's just sitting there. <laughs> it's not stalled. It's a, it's a stable configuration, unlike a hammerhead, which is transient, but it's not stalled. It's no airflow by definition, can't be stalled. Weird ways of thinking about things. <laughs> Well, this has been fantastic, Rich. I, I again, have to thank you for uh, this session and the session on Monday. They've both been fantastic. Anything else that uh, you want to close out with? Uh, no, just uh, like I said, don't, don't be afraid to experiment. I mean, we, we all tend to learn and we sort of stay in that, in that box of the things we learn and we don't really know, well, what's, what's outside of that, right? So some of that extra training will, will expose that to you and kind of show you where the real margins are. But also there's nothing that says that you can't experiment uh, on your own or with a, a competent CFI and, and see, well, let's, let's explore what this roll thing is and let's see adverse yaw. Let's, let's move the rudder a little bit. Uh, let's practice slipping. Um, I'm going to take a, a rough guess and, and guess that 70% of, of people who are listening only slip one way and they pray, they, they pray to uh, the aviation gods that the crosswind's never the other way. Uh, we should be ambidextrous. <laughs> we should be able to slip equally both ways. We should be able to take a slip in one direction and smoothly transition it to the other side. And that can be a whole other talk at some other you know, time on how to, how to slip airplanes and all of those aerodynamics, but, but experiment, uh, don't be afraid to keep learning. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure, because you wouldn't be tuning in if you weren't, uh, if you weren't um, long-term learners, right? If, if you didn't, didn't like the idea of continuing to learn, lifelong learners. So, so I always enjoy talking uh, to groups like that. And thanks again, Gabe, for putting that together and for everybody for taking time out of your 
evening. It, it is Tuesday night. I don't think there's really anything on TV. So maybe a captain. Wait, is it Tuesday? Or, no, it's Wednesday night. It's Wednesday oh, it's Wednesday night. night. Shows you how much I know. <laughs> uh, it's all together. Yeah, Monday, right? was something, Monday was something holiday. So we lost today. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, Rich, thank you. Uh, it's been this has been so much fun and, and fantastic to learn from. And like you said, you you know you don't know until you try, and you got to kind of take it there and, and try new things. So, um, and I got to tell you, everybody that shows up on these calls, um, we have a good group of people who continue to want to learn. So, uh, what a great combo! So, thanks again, Rich. Um, let's give Rich a virtual round of applause as always. Um, and I really appreciate the time. <laughs> I do wanna just remind people of uh, two, a few different things. Um, this weekend at Leesburg, uh, the Commemorative Air Force will be uh, uh, there between 10 and four. So if you wanna come out and check out some Warbirds, um, come on out between 10 and four to Leesburg. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is um, I'm trying to put together something that uh, we may be able to go to Ubar Hazy um, and do a, a social gathering there. Uh, and perhaps that be in the middle of November, but I'm speaking with them. Um, so stay tuned on that as, a, as an actual event that we might be able to do together. So anyways, those are the things to watch out for. Um, we'll continue to put on uh, events like this and um, I, I will be sharing this video probably in the next few days on our, our YouTube channel and, uh, and our website. But thanks again for everybody joining. Thanks for all the input and Rich, thank you. Uh, everyone have a good night. Thanks again. Thank awesome you. Job. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Be safe. Take care. Thanks for joining, everybody. See ya.